Welcome to the How Soccer Explains Leadership Podcast, where we explore leadership principles through the lens of the beautiful game. Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. Thanks again for being a part of the conversation. Thank you for engaging in what we get to talk about here, these great conversations we get to have with so many great people who are in the game. I'm Phil Dark, your host, and with me, as usual, is my brother, my partner in what we get to do here. Paul, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Phil. I mean, it's funny that you say that, like, here as usual, because there, it seems like not too long ago that I would just jump in every once in a while. And I, I just was reflecting the other day, like, how awesome it's been to be on these interviews and just so many great people we've been able to talk to over the last, gosh, is it almost, is it a year, two years now that we've been doing it together? Yeah. And today's not any different, man. I'm so pumped about our guest today, but things, things here are good. Family's doing great, kind of back in the routine after the holidays and just sports nonstop. Yeah. Just, I, I was laughing today. I was going to post something on, on the, the, the great web that we have of social media about if anybody needs anything, I have the answer for you. I realized today taking boys to school today that my boys know the answer to, they know all things. So I felt like I should give a service to the community by saying, Hey, if you need anything, please direct message me because I can ask my pool of four boys any question in the world and they will know the answer. Absolutely. So yes. I'll throw that to our community today and say, if anybody needs anything, please reach out because I have a network within my own household, boys ages six to 14, they know everything. So please feel, feel free to reach out uh, to, to us at any time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. And you know, that's, that is an open line. Paul Jobson, the legend just told you there's an open line. And you know, I will, I will say that I'm sure those answers are going to be incredible. So that, that'd be, that sounds like a lot of fun. And you know, we, we too, I'm in the middle of my, uh, soccer season. And you know, with that comes some, some joy and also some frustration. And this week has had both as you, as you know, um, that feeling, you know, it's that frustration of man, how can we can't get the best out of our players every single game, you know? And then, then you think about that in life, as we talk about these life lessons is, is how does that go to what our lives are too? Like, do I demand the best out of myself every single day? And do I, do I get the best out of myself every single day and all that we're doing? And so those, those are just some ponderings that I've been having lately. And, and in the midst of frustration, I kind of look in the mirror and go, well, you know, can I go to them and say, Hey, I give my best in all that I do. And, uh, that's something that, that I've been, I've been really, been really uh, going through now, but as you said, we have an, a great, great guest. And this is, this is kind of the first, we mentioned it last episode that we have some goodness coming out of the convention that we got to, that we got to go to and be a part of. And this is one of those people that we were able to meet through that medium. And, and it is coach Lincoln Phillips coach has uh, a, an incredible resume. I can, I can point you to go look that up. Please, he's written <laughs> books we're going to talk about on the show. He has been a, a goalkeeper for many, many years for Trinidad and Tobago and, and was not only a keeper for them, but he was named their goalkeeper of the century, which is pretty amazing. Not just of the year, not just an All-American or an All-Trinidadian, but goalkeeper of the century. That's pretty amazing. Also was the Caribbean keeper of, of the year or, or one of the all-time great keepers in the Caribbean. Coached for, he has coached for decades and is a legend of the game. Coach, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on your show. I, I saw you guys at the convention, but we weren't able to hook up. You know, I was a little disappointed because I, I like the uh, the title of the podcast. So I'm so glad to to hook up again with you guys and looking forward to the show. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, I kind of gave a little bit of the resume, but I want to get behind that on paper what we can read about you because i know there's so much more to the story so can you just briefly share that story you know i know it would be hours and hours and hours to share your story in fact there's a a movie being made about you so we're going to be able to watch that full you know in in on the screen here pretty soon but can you just share how you developed your passion for soccer for coaching for leadership and uh really how you got to be doing what you're doing today well it started early as far back as i can remember well, we lived in St. James, a small city in Trinidad. We all had a whole bunch of boys, and I was usually the youngest. And I was not talented at all. Everyone 
I was just so terrible in everything. And somehow or the other, that kind of got to me. I don't know. I can't explain it. But when the others were off doing other things, I was training. Say sometimes the players have training three times a week. I would train three times a week. I would train the morning of those three times. And then the Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday, I would also train. So between 12, 13, 14, and 15, I was just training so much harder and so much more than than all my other friends. And then all hell broke loose. I just started, in, instead of being the last person to be picked, I, all of a sudden I, was, I became the first person to be picked. And as a result, I was always picked on the adults team. This young boy, 16, 15, and he's with the adults. And I had to pay attention, you know, because I was a young boy on the team and, and we had very, very intelligent leaders and I paid attention to that. And when I got the opportunity to come back and play with my teammates my age, I was looked at as the, as the leader, as the captain. We never had coaches back then. The captain was always the coach, the person who everybody respects. Automatically, he is the, is the captain. And so I got that role as a, as a, as a youngster. And then playing, we, I played every position because, you know, when you're playing with adults, you play wherever they need you, you know. And I also played uh, basketball because soccer uh, in Trinidad, the the sports are seasonal. You know, when it's, when it's soccer season, if you're not playing soccer, then you're an outcast. You know, so you had to play every sport. And so it started then, I became a goalkeeper. And uh, the goalkeeper naturally, naturally is a leader. That position, you, you, you know, you can see everything developing in front of you. And what uh, assisted me a lot as a goalkeeper, I played center back just as good. Up, up until I was 19 years of age, I was playing in goal and center back, you know, for different teams. I also played center forward. Okay. So my, you know, we're talking about in, in 60s, you know, so my technical skills were very, very good. I was not just a goalkeeper. So I was an automatic sweeper keeper. And so I was always in a position of command and uh, always helping out the players, knowing what uh, a defender or a centre back goes through. I was able to to prepare them for for any oncoming attack and manoeuvre from the opposing team. So that really helped me with my leadership skills. So from very young, I had that opportunity to lead and to command and to motivate players, you know, to do their best in protecting the goal. So that helped me out a lot. So, yeah, that was that was the beginning. Yeah, and so from there, you got into coaching. So how did you get into coaching? And then yeah, how did that lead you through your career? And then what did, what are you doing today? Well, I was playing with my, uh, my club, my high school team. And that's where that when I was 18, 19. That was where... The, 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 I started to blossom in my talent. And from there, I, I, I went on to play with the Maple Football Club and we had some you know, national team captain. And so I patterned from them. And then I joined the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment. We had just gotten, Trinidad had just gotten the independence and we formed an army and, and they were recruiting young players. And I, I was promised that if I did well, I would get a physical training scholarship in England. So I joined the army and in the training, they, they, they teach you to be, a, to be a leader if you're going to be a non-commissioned officer. And I, I, I got to be a sergeant very quickly. And I was in charge mm-hmm. of physical education, physical fitness for the entire army. I was sent to England in Hampshire at the Army School of Physical Training. And there I received uh, so much information on, on, on how to be a good leader. You know, and I came back and I was able to impart that with my team. And uh, then I, I was uh, on the national team in 1967. We played in the Pan Am Games. 
And you remember that is that's the year that the North, the North American Soccer League started in the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's all by divine intervention here. You know, people doubt God, but there's a God. Okay. Yeah. At that time, we, we, we played in the Pan Am Games, and our division was Trinidad and Tobago, Colombia, Argentina, and Mexico. <laughs> we had absolutely no chance. You know? Well, as it turned out, we beat Argentina. Wow. We, beat, we, we beat Colombia 4-3 after losing 3 nothing at halftime. You know, that was the worst first half I've ever had in my life, letting me three <laughs> bad goals. But afterwards, everything was great. And make a long story short, we, we ended up getting a bronze medal. Wow. And fortunately, the, the the folks in the North American Soccer League were, were scouting. Mm. And they thought my, that my goalkeeping was good enough to warrant a contract. So from from there, I went back home and they sent a scout to look at one of the games we played. And the scout, this is what he told me. He came in 10 minutes before the end of the game. And I made two of the greatest saves I've ever made in my entire life. They were so great that I never made them again in life. <laughs> <laughs> and you, so you could imagine, you know, the, the, the Lord really prepared this. You know, he came in just in time, stood up behind the goal to see me make two fantastic saves. And when and this is what he's telling me. And when I made made those saves, he says, Baltimore Bays. So I got a, a, a walloping contract of seven thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> and talked to my wife about it. Uh, yeah, I always, you know, have to get the, the okay from her once she's okay. That's right. And then I'm good. I had two kids at the time. And so she said, you know, if anybody can do it, you can. And so with that, I was off to the United States to play professional in the North American Soccer League with the Baltimore Bays and Gordon Jago as my first professional coach. Wow. That's 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 all. There's so there's so much in there, Coach. And I, I man, if we could dive in, Phil. This is one of those episodes that could be, you know, a series, right? An entire yes. season yes. talking to Coach yes. Coach here. But but Coach, uh, you know, I I love it. And yes, I, I we Phil and I are in total agreement. There is a God, and He orchestrates things to to right. to, to honor Him to honor Him, and uses us in some really amazing ways, and has done that with you, obviously, which is I, I absolutely love that. And yes, you are. If I didn't already know you were a smart man, now I, I really believe it because you know you confirmed <laughs> it is smart to check with your wife before you make any major oh, decisions, right? So, yes. so we're all we're all in agreement here. If we weren't before, uh, we're all unified in this. But, coach, through through all of these things and through your amazing career and all the things that God's allowed you to do and provided for you, what would you say is your 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 personal why? And maybe through your life, your your why has changed. But what would you say is been your why, what has been your life purpose, and, and how do you feel like you're living that out? That's a good question. It's a good question. When, when I was in the period where I was not a very good athlete, you know, I had one or two people. One of them, his name is Carlton Doe, the other one is Carl Allion, and they, they just took an interest in me, you know? And they, they, you know, the things they said to me, they didn't correct me, okay? There was no criticism. Only when I did things right. I didn't know, I didn't understand it then. But I understand it now, okay? They never criticized me, okay? They always told me when I did something right, they, they commented on it. So that was a good feeling. They made me feel confident when I had no confidence. And then later on, I met other mentors who really did the same for me at, at, at a higher level. So I, I said to myself from very early, if I could do half as much as what Pa Aliong and, and, and Carlton Doe and some of my mentors did, okay, if I can achieve half as much, then my life will not be in vain. And so... I, I grew through there, okay? And I always had an opportunity 
And whenever I had an opportunity to, to help somebody develop or come out of a rut or whatever, I would always make sure that I go to that person. You know, so helping people become successful. And I was a successful, very successful athlete. And now my job is to help other people become successful. And that I think is significant. Yeah, that that's that's amazing. I think that speaks really well to a lot of people that listen to 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 our our podcast and, and they're you know either young coaches or veteran coaches. And I think we hear, you know, over and over again just that the the impact that we can make as coaches, not even when it comes to the X's and O's of the game, right? But but how are we impacting? And I, I love what you said about you know your mentors and people that that spoke into you and really hit the positive, right? Because when we when we do something wrong, we usually know it. Right. Yes. So we don't really need yes. somebody to remind us that we've done exactly. something wrong. And I'm but I'm guilty of doing it as a coach and as a parent for sure. But I love that that that's what was spoken into you and that you've been able to pass that on. And I just would love for our our audience if they get a moment, hey, rewind that and listen to that again, because I think that's really impactful on how we how we lead and how we how we influence those that are around us day in and day out. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and and so can you just remind us where you have coached and how long you've been coaching. Cause I think that goes into a lot of the next things we're going to be talk about um, that. It's not, you didn't just coach for a couple of years and just dabble in it. So can you just give your coaching background real quick for, for our audience? Yeah, well, and um, it started way back in, in the sixties, you know, I, I was always the captain of my team and so on, but where I became the, the coach as such uh, was in the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment. That was about 20, 21. And I became the the captain. So obviously the, all the coaching and, and so on fell on my on my shoulders. So I stayed there in the in the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment for six years. And uh the first year, you know, it was was an introductory year. And uh after that for, for five years straight we we won all the all the awards, all the championships we had some of the best players. And then moving from there, I, I got that contract with the with the, the Baltimore Bays in 1968. And in 1968, they had the North American Soccer League. And then there was a semi-professional league called the American Soccer League. Now, those players who played at least 50% in the NASL were eligible to play in the in the American Soccer League. Now the American Soccer League had some very outstanding players. At that time, in the different cities, you know, New York, Washington, you know, Philadelphia, where there were a lot of immigrants from Russia, from Europe, and the Caribbean. And so soccer was really big. Amateur soccer was really big in those areas. And and the best out of those players played in the American Soccer League. So the league was was just as good as the North American Soccer League. So teams from the American Soccer League were very competitive. And at the end of the, the season with the Baltimore Bays, I was recommended by the coach, Con Jago, to the manager, general manager of the, the Washington Darts to be their coach, to be their player coach. And that was my first time as a coach, even though I was a player. And I stayed there at the, at the Washington Dash for three years. We were American Soccer League champions for three years. And from there, soccer, uh, professional soccer started dying off. The league folded and so on. And then college soccer became the highest level of soccer at that time. And... I was conducting a clinic. I, I I love a clinic. I do a clinic on the moon. Anywhere, I, I, I would do a clinic. <laughs> I enjoy doing clinic. And I was doing this clinic with the Special Olympics. Mm. And the old coach from Harvard University, he, a Black American coach, he was an, an elderly man. He was the coach of the soccer team. He started the soccer team at Harvard University in the 40s. Right? And we had a lot of 
immigrants come to Howard University from Africa, from, from the Caribbean and so on. And, and they could not relate to the basketball and football. So Coach Chambers decided to introduce soccer and cricket to help immigrants. And that's how soccer started at Howard University. So comes 19, come 1970, okay, the professional football is dying, you know, and I came up to the to Harvard, to, to the University to America to further my studies through soccer. I got that opportunity. He saw me in action and he asked me to come and do a clinic and that was it. Okay. I came, I did the clinic and then I stayed with Howard University for 10 years. Then after how we won a few championships there, and um, we can talk about that later, but we won a few championships and that I spent 10 years there. And later on, I went back, the, the, the league, professional league started up again. And I went back with a new version of the base as the, as the uh, goalkeeper coach. And um, also the Baltimore Comets. You know, I was not a coach there, but, you know, I, I did a lot of coaching duties there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you coach coaches. Right. Yes. That's the mentor, your mentor, which is which is awesome. And I, I love what you said there. And don't miss that, folks, where he said, I started my coaching career as a captain. There's so many captains out there who just think that it means going to midfield and doing the coin toss. Mm -hmm. But being a captain, as you say, the best teams, they say bad teams, no one leads. Good teams, coaches lead the best team players lead. And I think that that is so true. Um, not that coaches just sit down and don't do anything, but to be able to pour into captains and to be able to help captains understand that they are the leaders of that team and they need to be the leaders of that team. They need to be a coach on the field and off the field as well mm -hmm. and do that in concert with the head coach, not in conflict with the head coach, to not be talking a bad about them, but to be part of that system. So, mm -hmm. All right. So you talk about goalkeeping. We talked about that. You were a goalkeeper coach. You were a goalkeeper. You were a captain as a goalkeeper. And even if you're not captain by name, a goalkeeper will always be, should always be leading from the back. That's what I'm always coaching my goalkeepers to do as well. So you wrote this book, Goalkeeping, The Last Line of Defense, The First Line of Attack. All right. What, what's your vision for that book? Why, why did you write it? And what do you hope people will do with more excellence after reading it? Well, I wrote that book as the first book I wrote, and I mean, from scratch. And I can tell you, I will never do that again in my life. It's the <laughs> hardest thing I've ever done. You know, when you write something, when you have something in your mind and you write it down, when you read what is written, it's mm -hmm. not what you want to say. That's right. You know, yeah. and um <laughs> I, I wrote the book and I spent about a year, two, uh, two years writing this thing. And then I, I just threw it away. And eventually my wife said, you know, look, you spend so much time on this. You know, you got to finish it because that's what you want to do. You know, she has more confidence in me than mm -hmm. I had in myself. Have in myself Sounds like you know? more wisdom, too. Sounds like more, more wisdom, wisdom, too. Yeah. Yeah. Wisdom. Yeah. 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 yeah <laughs> and so we, we went down to the to, to beach in North Carolina. And we spent a weekend down there. Oh, man, it was amazing. I just got, I finished the book. Okay. And the whole idea of the book is to, is based on my experience. Okay. The goalkeeper is not just a, a shot stopper. The goalkeeper needs to be a footballer. You know, he needs to be able to play just as well as the players on players uh, out on the field and we, we we have so many so many coaches and so many young goalkeepers that's all that's all they play you mm -hmm. know the play and goal and when the ball is at their feet you know it's they're not as good and as comfortable with that and now that this sweeper keeper is 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 vogue now you know a lot of uh, goalkeepers uh, sometimes take too many risks and they're playing, out, in my estimation, they're playing too far out, you know. But uh, now the, the modern goalkeeper is to be a, a football player. And that's one of the reasons why I, I wrote the book. Another reason is to, is to get the technical side of goalkeeping down, okay, especially catching the ball, okay. 
too many goalkeepers I've seen, even on the professional level, they, they, they parry this ball, parry it back into play. And when you coach outfield players, you explain to them how important that first touch is. That first touch must be able to give you that opportunity to do whatever you want with the ball on the second touch. Mm -hmm. Right? I call it the sophisticated first touch. And goalkeeping is the same. Okay? We must try to catch the ball as often as we can. There are times when it's not uh, advisable to catch it, then you can parry and punch the ball sideways. But too many goalkeepers put the ball back in the play. And I focus a lot on the technical aspect of the game. And, and also the, the coming off the line, 1v1, that's my specialty. I, that's my specialty. I, I've learned how to come off the line because I understand what forwards, what forwards like. And sometimes I give them an opening to the right and, and um, they think they've gotten it. And I, I, I go to the right and get it. And so those are the things that when I wrote the book, I was hoping that a, a lot of young goalkeepers read it, especially, especially the, the, the one v ones because they, so many goalkeepers get beaten with the one v ones They come out with their legs open. And you no, know, we've got to just stand, stay behind the ball. And a lot of times the ball will play you. You know, yep. and so so that's that. They did, and and the cross balls, of course, and it's very important. If you if you're a goalkeeper, you got you gotta you gotta manage that area. You gotta take charge of that area. You know, and so that basically those are the, the few things that I wrote the book to to get across to our young goalkeepers and also goalkeeper coaches. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that as a as a goalkeeper and a goalkeeper coach. One of the the things I always say to keepers is, you know, you should, if you never played striker, you need to play striker at some point. Yes, indeed. Because you got to know how a striker thinks, right? And I, I love, my daughter is a striker and I trained her for, for about three months as a 10 year old with her friend to play keeper. Mm -hmm. She came out mm -hmm. to trainings just with her friend. And then last year as a freshman in high school on the varsity team, the both keepers went down with injuries. Mm -hmm. And she said, I can play. Yeah. And she went back there and did really, really well on just on because she's a student of the game and she plays striker and she knows a she's lot. A good athlete. She's a good athlete. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And she went back there and to your point was leading from the back. She knows the game. And so she was able to speak to people. And I love that. But with the one on ones, one of the, one of the things I talk about so a lot with keepers is a lot of one V ones is instinct. Mm -hmm. is when to come out and to know that. Mm -hmm. And that's that can be developed, but a lot of it's just you got to know when to come out. How much do you think of that as, as teachable? A lot of it. A lot of it. When we practice the goalkeeper, <coughs> excuse me, in catching the ball, we go over that all the time. Diving, we go over that all the time so the body becomes accustomed. But how many times do we practice the goalkeepers with 1v1s. We really, goalkeeping coaches really do this. And mm -hmm. to what, what I have done with a lot of my coaches is to set up a defense and play the ball through, okay? Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the ball is traveling X amount of miles per hour. The goalkeeper has to judge whether he can get to that ball or not. You know, and uh, the, the the body, the human uh, brain is such a magnificent machine that mm -hmm. that it, it 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 makes those adjustments. You know, but it, it has to be done regularly. At half line, you have four defenders there. You knock a few balls through. You know, and the goalkeeper will come out and get it. Sometimes you knock one 50, 50 or 60, 40 in his favor. And the goalkeeper will get an opportunity to judge when the speed of the ball, the distance, the play is coming at, all of those. The brain will take care of that. But it has to be done on a regular basis. So it is it is teachable, very, very yeah. much so. Yeah. Coaches don't miss that. 
too often we say, okay, goalkeepers, go train on the side. Yes. yes. Go train on the side. Go do your thing. Get shot at. Go warm up, and then we'll do some drills, and we'll shoot at you. And as and with we get any all the, other, and we get all the blame when a goal is scored. Yep. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But like every other skill, it's got to be trained over and over and over to become that exactly. muscle memory that you talked about. And if you're yeah. not training that over and over in actual game speed, which is you can't do that game mentality mm -hmm. just with a coach kicking a ball over here and having them come out because you can't exactly. replicate that game speed. And so to be able to do that and that takes commitment mm -hmm. to training the goalkeepers as part of the team and not just be uh, as collateral of, Oh yeah, you'll get the training because of the drill that we're doing. You right. have to focus on the keepers actually being trained and they with have the to do team. it over and over. Yeah. With and, the team. And, with, and with the team, you know, long ago, the goalkeepers never used to get any special training, but then there came a period where everybody recognized that yes, the goalkeeper is a specialist and he has to be trained in the specialty area. And they took the goalkeeper off in a corner and, and they would work him to death for the whole full practice mm -hmm. session. And, and only when you want to do shooting practice, you know, target practice, he comes in. But yep. now it's, it's, it's changing, okay? The goalkeeper, of course, he needs to do his individual training. We can do that before mm -hmm. the session or maybe after the session. But once he starts training with the team, as often as possible, he should be involved in a game-like situation uh, as, as a goalkeeper. We should not miss that that training session to, to, to get him acquainted in situations that are similar to the game. Yep. All right. So now we have a couple age-old debates I'm going to ask you. All right. So goal, corner kicks. Mm -hmm. Defenders on the post or no defenders on the post? I would live and die with a defender on the first post and a defender on the last post. I, no one has really convinced me, you know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm the best coach in the world or, or I'm, I'm right, you know, but no one has yet convinced me that playing with, uh, playing with no players on, on the post is a good idea. Okay. People have told me you have numerical superiority, you have more, more defenders than, than, than attacking players. I, I to me, that don't make sense because I've seen one player jump over three players and head the ball and score. You know, so that that doesn't work for me at all. I think, and I think uh, American goalkeeping coaches should start questioning things because we are not that we are not beginners in the game anymore. I have seen some goalkeeping training and on internet and it's absolutely fantastic. We have outstanding goalkeeping coaches and but we must not take verbatim what happens in Europe. Okay? We have to ask ourselves, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, the goalkeeper, when I put two players on that post, they have a small goal post. Let's say from the from the post, you go about a yard, okay, and you make a little goal post there. And on the other post, the same thing. That is his goal. Okay? And when the ball comes over, they protect those two spots. That get that gives the goalkeeper just six yards, a goal post of six yards instead of eight. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now I know for me that I have two Trojans in the back. And so anything in the air is mine. I go out for that ball that's lofted across the goal without any fear. And even if I get there late, I know I'm covered. You know? So I, you know, I believe, I believe that as a goalkeeper, your job is to narrow the space from which a, an attacking player can shoot into, right? So yep. therefore, he does not stand on his line. Whenever somebody's going to shoot, 
he comes off his line and play back. Okay? He reduces the space. And why, with no players on the post, why are we expanding the space? It, it, it just doesn't make sense at all. Okay? So if we are to use one person on the on the post, then I would prefer to have that that person be the front postman, first post person. Mm -hmm. Right? And then on the second post, I would have that player about three yards away from the post, but he must be trained if the ball is lofted to the center of the field, okay? He must be trained to come back into that post, into that position. Mm -hmm. You know? I I and and if because I, I I'm not saying I'm hundred percent correct, but some people you know like to have one on the post, and they have, they have a reason to feel good about it. So if you're going to do that, then you must train the players to protect that position. Yeah, and I would venture to say that most goalkeepers would agree with you. It's a lot of the coaches that coach their team to not do that never played goalkeeper, and I I, I agree with that because the keeper has got to own the box. Yes. And the keeper can own the box a lot easier if he can go, he or she can go out, punch the ball away, catch the ball, and have yeah. have confidence exactly. that there are people behind me. But the thing that you said there that I think is the biggest teaching point of all has nothing to do with post or no post. It has to do with the fact that you said, we as coaches need to question things. We can't just say, oh, we do Rondo because they do it at Barcelona or they do it somewhere mm -hmm. else. Rondo may be a great thing. I'm not saying it's not. Yeah. But why? What What purpose does it serve for us? All these other drills that we're doing, how can we do it in a way with the different strategies, the different formations? It seems like, you know, we used to just always play 4-4-2 because everyone played 4-4-2. Now everyone plays 4-3-3 because everyone plays 4-3-3. But you may not have the personnel to play a 4-3-3 or exactly. a 4-4-2 well. And exactly. you need to say, who is my personnel? Who are my best players? We want to get the best players on the field to be able to play the best we can play as a team. But that starts with questioning and saying, just because somebody else does it doesn't mean it works for us. And that is something that is so important. And I love that you said that. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as I said before, Americans are no novices to the game anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we have, we have, uh, America is, 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 is the last big country to really come into big World Cup football. And we have, we have qualified all our national teams for FIFA competition. And most countries, you know, they are soccer countries and they have never done that. We've done it with the men and the women. Okay? So I'm not saying that we should revolutionize the game or change the game or whatever. Or, but we, 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 have to, we have to consider certain things, you know, and, and, and ask yourself, you know, is that good for my team? You see, when we have these coaching courses, they give you certain things to work with. But when you you as a coach, you've got to tweak it. Okay? You gotta push a player up at certain times of the game, you put a player back certain times of the game. You in in, in marking on corner kicks, maybe you can play a zone, or if they have an outstanding guy who scores all the goals on the head, then you play a zone plus one, one man to man. And 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 you keep you keep adjusting to the game, and sometimes you have to adjust to the game <clears throat> during the game. Yep. yep. And that's 100%. where your captain comes. That's where your captain comes in. Yeah. You know. Let me let me mention one situation. I was playing for the Baltimore Comets. We were playing. We were playing in Dallas, and at that time, Kyle Rowe Jr., an American, he was the top goal scorer in the league, and he was just superb. In the air. No one could beat him in the air. So the game that we played in Dallas, wet day, and the first two, uh, first five minutes, you know, he got a long throw in, headed the ball to far post. I don't know how they didn't score. All right? So immediately, I called back my tall English center forward, had my center back mark him at the back, and uh, my center forward mark him in front. And that was the end of it. If I had waited for the coach to make that change, we would be in trouble. So, as you said, the, the the captain the captain has to make decisions because he is the coach there on the field. He is definitely yeah. a leader. Yeah, abs absolutely. And I think 
you know, the, the initial question was, you know, post or not post, but I think that, and, and I loved everything you had to say, and, and I'm the one person on this call who's not a goalkeeper. Okay. So <laughs> that's, that I'm not the goalkeeper, but I think at the end of the day, the ultimate answer on that question is, okay, what is the game? What is the game bringing to the situation that will then provide your answer? Now, if I go into the game blind, you know, your answer is I'm going to start front and back post. You know, if I if I have information within the game before the game on a team and I know what they're doing on their corners and maybe I make adjustments, maybe I have that hybrid player right that on the back post, maybe doesn't start on the post, but shifts back into the post when the ball is serviced. Right. So that I think is is I mean, I love not being the goalkeeper. I love that answer of like adapt to to to, to the game. And I think Absolutely. to your point. There are too many coaches that adopt a philosophy that becomes their philosophy and they hold so high, so tightly to it. They never become learners of the game and then can never teach the game. Exactly. The coaches that say, hey, what is the game bringing and how do I adjust to it? Those are the coaches that are giving the most to their players because they're actually allowing their players to think. Right. Yes. And the, the whole thing, we won't go on this rabbit trail of like, you know, over coaching players, allowing free play. You know, when you were when you were a kid and you were growing up, you were the coach, but you were a player. That's that's free play in our society now. That's hey guys, go play pickup in the park. There's no coach. You're just you're playing and you're and you're learning. So I I'm, I'm a big fan of the you know let the game dictate the adjustments you need to make exactly. Uh, and and exactly. if you're a coach who 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 leans that way, you will develop those captains and those leaders who have the comfort they're comfortable enough in the game, right. To make those decisions because they're like, Oh, my coach will be on board because he's going to ask me when I come off anyway, what did I see? Right. Yeah. So anyway, I, I love that. That's a, that's a whole nother show, Phil, for, for coach. When yeah. Coach back well, yeah. On. Um, 100% part two, part so, two, part two. Right. So, yeah. So let's, uh, yeah, my brain, my brain's going that way a little bit. So coach, mm -hmm. One of the things we love to do on this show, and it's, you know, how soccer explains leadership and, it you know, leadership and soccer, football, it all overlaps in, into life. Tell us a little bit from your experience as 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 a goalkeeper, as, as a goalkeeper coach, just as a football footballing coach and mentor. What life lessons and leadership lessons have you learned through this amazing sport? Well, <clears throat> as, as a leader, whether you have the position given to you, or, or, or you're the captain or you're your goalkeeper, your position is a position of leadership, okay? If I have to lead, <clears throat> if I have to lead, if I'm the king of a, of a kingdom and I have my gods, you know, God and me, I have to treat them right because they're, gonna, they're there to protect my life. So I have to treat them right. Make sure that I have a good relationship with them. The same thing in soccer. Okay, as a goalkeeper, you have to have you have to have those guys who are there to defend you, to trust you, and trust is a very important part of leadership. If you're in a business or a big company and you're the leader, if if that if that business is to go well at the bottom line, the 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 employees must have trust in in the leader right and once that trust is there and then the trust doesn't come just by itself okay there are a lot of things that come that comes that, that comes with it and and helps you to develop the ability to to, to trust a person in front of you things like uh, relationships okay you gotta you gotta have a good relationship you gotta understand the players around you, what their shortcomings are. You've got to have that knowledge of, of what they like, what they dislike, in order to help them out whenever they 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 get into any difficulties. You know? So if that happens on the field as a goalkeeper, as a player, okay, developing trust, okay, developing relationships. And uh, when things go wrong, you know, you you help motivate. A leader, whether on the football field or in an office, the leader has to be able to 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 motivate players 
and motivate employees to come outside there to work and, and do their best. They must feel good about coming out to practice and, and they must like you. They must like you. If they don't like you personally, they'll, they'll like your style because you're fair and you're, you're honest and you, you, know, you help them when they're down. Same thing in soccer, same thing as an executive. So I think the sport and the soccer in particular is, is, is a reflection of life. It's a mirror of life. And many of my soccer players, especially the ones at Howard University, have spent 10 years there. I have always <clears throat> allowed my players to coach. I had a camp, the Lincoln Phillips Soccer School, and most of the players were, were, were teachers in the camp. So to teach, to learn is to teach. If you give somebody an opportunity to teach, they will learn that topic a lot better. So when they came back to me, okay, they were they were open to open to to, to learn it because they, they got to know the, 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 the topic what they were teaching very well. So I think I think sport and soccer in particular is, is a reflection of, of, of life and, and, and leadership. Yeah, 100% agree with that. It's funny you mentioned that about allowing players to coach. I found as we were doing camps through our through our career and allowing players to, to coach, how much more understanding they had yes. of the game just yes. by teaching and, mm -hmm. and giving you know giving to to others and and, mm -hmm. and and selfishly and this isn't the reason that you do it but they also tend to understand a little bit more your role as the as the coach uh, exactly. and tend to have a little bit more respect we, we, yes. we would have we would have things in our spring season where we allow our girls to take a session hey you guys mm -hmm. plan the session put it together lead the session mm -hmm. and it never failed at the beginning like, yeah yeah no problem we got this coach and the next day they come in, we're not, we don't know what to do. What, what do we do here? You know, uh, how, do we, how do we put this out? So I, I, either I, that, that. I either that or they come and do the same thing you've been, you've yeah, been right, doing. Right, all right. Coach, and that, that would be it. Hey, coach, think about doing the session you did last week. What do you think? I'm like, no, 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 no. You can't, you can't do that. That's cheating. What, uh, coach, let's talk about like just your, your career, you know, and, and defining moments. I think each of us through our, through our lives have moments that just kind of define us as, as who we are and really maybe push our paths in certain directions and God leads that. But what, what, tell us about a defining moment that stands out in your, in your career. If you can pick one, I'm sure there are many, but is there, is there mm -hmm. one just really defining moment you can look back to and say, okay, this really defined me as who I, who I am as a, as a coach, as a leader, as a, as a, as a person. Well, the um, 1974 championship, now, we won the, the NCAA championship in 1971, okay? And um, they, 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 they took it away from us for dubious reasons. That's, that's for another day. And we won that championship because we had great players, okay? So they took it away, and they, they not only took it away from us, but they put us on one year's probation. That to me was was absolutely unnecessary. So the 1974 was the season that we came back and we were, we were eligible to play uh, um, the NCAA championship. And I remember vividly going to Nigeria and getting some of the six of the best Nigerian soccer players, young soccer players. Outside, those are soft, those type of players are the ones who go go to Europe now because at that time the, the Europe was did not open the doors to uh, African and Caribbean nations. That season, Paul was a season of redemption. We lived for that season. It was unfair, and we had a slogan: "Truth crushed, the earth shall rise again." I was. I didn't come up with it. I was looking at the football team, the American football team practice. One day I, I was on the fence and a young doctor who was a good supporter of the soccer team came and he said, coach, you know, you, you, you look like you're in a, in a pensive mood. I said, yeah, man, I'm trying to look for a slogan to, to rally the team, you know. He said, I'll I tell, I, I tell you what, truth crush to it shall rise again. I said, oh my God. 
That is it, you know? And I went inside, wrote it down, and that was the slogan that carried us through the season, okay? Now, we played, we played well, beat up everybody, and then got to the finals. And it was, the game started late, and it was the worst first half of soccer that we played for the entire season against St. Louis. We were lucky to come off the field at halftime, one goal down. And in the second half, I made some substitutions. I bring in a fullback who had not played for most of the season and put him at halfback because our halfbacks were not doing well. And that was, the, that was, that was a really big gamble. And make a long story short, the team did well. We came in four overtime. We triumphed. We won the national championship. And that was a, that was a feeling of, I, I can't explain exactly how it felt, but it was a weird feeling. It was a feeling of redemption. I don't know what we would have done if we had lost that game. So that feeling to me is one of the, the greatest highs that I've ever gotten in soccer. Yeah. And I, and coach, I'll just, I, I want to, you know, just, just say this. I, I don't know that any of our listeners can probably really ever really understand it, everything that underlies that, from 1971 to 1974. I, I just don't think that we can. And I mean that out of respect. I just don't think we can. And I, and I, I value that and appreciate you sharing that. And that, that is a massively impactful story. And I, and I appreciate you sharing that. And I think it's awesome. And again, I think that's episode four, Phil, of the series. We'll talk about yes. Coach Phillips, yes. uh, from Howard. And I just think that's amazing. Can you repeat that slogan for us one more time, just so we catch that? That's by Emerson, as truth crushed to earth shall rise again. I love it. I love it, love too. It. Yeah. You know, I, I just couldn't help but to think back to our interviews with, and we did have a part two of that one, so maybe that's a foreshadowing, uh, with Clyde Best. And just, you know, for those of you who don't know, Howard is a, a you know historically black, you know, institution. And... That time was a, was a tough time. And, and I know Clyde playing over, you know, in England during that time and then coming to the NASL and playing here and just hearing through the, a lot of the things that he had to go through and, and how he dealt with them and dealt with them with class and dealt with them with character and to build character. But no one wants to go through those things. No one had, you know, and I, and did not even get into details to know that there are things that are warring against us at different times and the life lesson out of it is, you know, what can you do? What is the controllable that you have is to do your best to keep going hard, to keep doing it, to keep going after it. And that's that. I love that story. Love that story. All right. So coach, you know, you have, I read in an article that you wrote, I believe you wrote it or someone wrote about you, but you, you had said you've described being a coach as an awesome responsibility because a coach is a quote mentor, friend, <clears throat> disciplinarian, taskmaster, therapist, and confidant who shapes and influences the lives of others. Too many people just focus on one of those things or a couple of those things and miss the rest of them. Um, why is it so important to be all those things, first of all? And secondly, who is a coach other than yourself, other than Paul Jobson, of course, who is a legend in the game? Yeah, thanks, Phil. But thanks. Other than <laughs> that, who is someone who who modeled that for you, that taught you that? And who lived that out that you could learn from, and what kind of set them apart? Well, that that was Coach Chambers, but the the previous coach at Howard University, Theodore Ted Chambers. He was the soccer coach. Didn't know anything about soccer, but they started the game to get the give the foreigners an opportunity to play. He was just when I came to when I came to Howard. Remember, I told you I, was, I spent about six years in the army. I was I was a, a military coach. I moved everybody from 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 right to left and grease lightning time and oh, and I was just I, I was an autocratic coach, you know. And when I came to 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 Howard University, I had very intelligent players. You see, and 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 sometimes I sometimes I was too harsh on them, and then. He was able to nonverbal, nonverbal signs. You could see when when I said something, 
I, it, it did please him. He just he would look down and he'd look at me and he'd, he'd give a little smile and so on. So I, I got to I got to, to read him very well. And as a result, you know, he smoothened the edges for me. And I became a, a less of an autocratic coach and I became more democratic. And I, I, I slid from autocratic to democratic, backward and forward, based on the teams that we had at the time. But on, apart from that, some of the players, you know, uh, you know, one of them was, it was in med school. And before he went to med school, he was married and had about three kids, three or four kids. He's living in an abandoned home. He got to find out. And he was able to, to, to go to them and bring food and different things. I'm getting a little choked up thinking about it, you know, when, this, when the same player told me the story of how many times Coach Chambers came to them and they had nothing to eat. They don't know where anything was coming from. He had that human touch. You see, humanity is the greatest human value you could ever find. If you are a, a very a good coach, and you are blessed with humanity, you're going to be one of the best. Okay? If you're a doctor and you're blessed with humanity, you're going to be one of the best. Because that humanity is that ability of, of, of an individual to look at somebody. It doesn't have to be somebody he knows, but somebody and know right away that this person needs this or that and provide it for him or her at the right time, at the right moment. You know, if a person has that ability and coach chambers, you know, I, I learned that from him, you know. And so he was one of the guys that really uh, influenced my, my, my philosophy. And the other one was Harry Kehoe, coach of St. Louis University. When we, we played St. Louis University three times, we won, we won twice and they won once, Okay. It was all white and we were all black. And the respect that we had, you know, whenever we played teams, you know, they would call us all sorts of racial names and so on. St. Louis, respect. Tons of respect. We respected each other's ability. And as a result, sometimes during the height of the game, Harry will walk over to me and we'll have a conversation. And people can understand how we could do that. But, you know, it, it, it was just like, like, like great people meeting one another and understanding that, that the game is, we can't do anything about the game right now. <laughs> the game is up to the players, you know. And <clears throat> when they took the championship away from us in 71, we, we beat St. Louis. They decided to give it to St. Louis and Harry Kihu refused it. He mm -hmm. said, St. Louis is not wins. St. Louis wins soccer games on the field. And besides that, I know Coach Lincoln Phillips. He's a gentleman, and I will never do that to him. Mm -hmm. You know, every time I tell that story, it just touches me. I love mm -hmm. him, you know, and, and, you know, all the players from that time, Whenever they meet up with Howard University players, they meet up with big hugs and so on. They just it's just a bond between St. Louis and Howard University players during that time. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Silence. I love, I love that. <laughs> yes, that's I, I have, have, no, have nothing to say to follow up on that. That's just that's amazing. <laughs> and the the, key, the I'm assuming it's the same Kehoe family that's been around forever. Rob Kehoe is that the same family? <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's a, that's, a, Ty, that's awesome. Ty Kiyo and all them, they're, yeah. they're just oh man. I met yeah. I met Ty one day long after his dad died, and he came. I was looking at a soccer game, and he came up in the stands. He saw me. He said, "I just want to meet you because you wouldn't believe how much my father loved you and worshipped you." I said, mm. "Oh my God!" Yeah. It's just the same, just the same, you know. Good man. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's what my kids are gonna go to say to Paul someday. <laughs> yes, someday. Listen, 
<laughs> Coach, don't don't let Phil build me up to be something that I'm not. Okay, it's just it's almost you know. In a minute, he's going to tell you I'm six foot four, which is a total lie. <laughs> I'm way shorter than that. That's why I wasn't a goalkeeper. You know, but Coach, you you've been part of this beautiful game at so many different levels, and I, I would just love to hear. We talked a little bit about your, you know, how you feel like, you know, coaches need to not be focused on what's going on in Europe, but, but, you know, truly read the game and be, you know, make the game what it needs to be in the, in the moment. But where do you think in the United States in particular, can you just give us a brief, like, what are some things you feel like as a country we're doing really, really well? And what are some things we just need to continue to work on? Well, I, I think the levels of football we have now, we have the professional league, and then and and then now the the, the uh, MLS they they have the, the these academies, you know. My son Sheldon he is now the he is now with the Philadelphia Academy, and they're the only MLS team that has a private school for the players, mm -hmm. and he is the the senior director of the player and safeguard unit, and um, so they have so many different levels. The, the the USISL or whatever, and, and then they have the college level. The college level is is that's professional. A lot of people seem to think that it's you know it's it's, it's not good and it's too distant. But I can take a, uh, the top ten college teams and play anybody's national team, and the game will be competitive. You know, so. If you can play on it in the college level and shine and be outstanding, you have an opportunity to play on the next level and then on the next level. I think that is great, especially these academies. I think that is going to do well for soccer in America. But uh, I think sometimes the focus is too much in those developmental leagues. The focus is too much on winning. Uh, even even in, on, in the youth leagues and so on, it's too much on winning. We need to develop skillful ball players, and America is a is a hot dog country. You look at, at the things we do in basketball and 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 what do you call the skateboards and so on. They, they, you know, they improvise and so on. We need to to give the players an opportunity to be creative and and develop a lot of skills with the ball. When that happens on the youth level, then we're in business. Mm -hmm. business is then it's going to come they're going to they can be competitive after you get that solid foundation technical foundation then we can now apply it into a, a competitive situation i think uh, 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 as you said earlier on that we shouldn't focus on what's happening in in europe yeah we should focus you know take the good things you know and and, and treat them a bit you know, don't yeah. because that's where the best soccer is being played right now. And wherever the best soccer is played right now, you got to key in to what's going on there. But then you uh, then take the things that is uh, that are good for you and and Americanize it, Americanize mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That's so good. And I, we talk about that a lot on this show is the need for creativity in the game. And so much of that creativity comes from free play, which we don't have. Everything's structured now. And totally agree with that. I just think of my son who watches a lot of the, you know, watches a lot of European football because we watch, the, you know, you watch the best. So you can you can learn from that and you can model yes. a lot of that. But, you know, I was I was reading a book recently talking about you know, Xavi and, and Nesta in the midfield of that, those great Barcelona teams and how they moved the ball around. And they did it. They did it a lot of times on that Tiki Taka football, but the guy said the thing that they had that most people never had was one of the best, if not the best playmakers the world has ever known in mm -hmm. Messi to finish off those movement of the ball. If they don't have him, are they as great as they were? Probably as far as ball handlers, but as far as would everybody have known them, maybe not. I don't who knows, you know, to go to American football, Tom Brady, a great quarterback. But would he have been if he wasn't on those great Patriot teams? We will never know. But you got to realize that just because something works for these guys in that midfield may not work for somebody else. And so we as players need to say, what can I take from that to learn in my game and include that in my game and then go out to the park and try it. And yes. try stuff that you're going to do that's going to create something else that you might create. And, you know, the Cruyff didn't come just because, you know, 
somebody taught Johan Cruyff how to do this thing. No, he went out and played somewhere and did something, and he probably wasn't the first one to do it. He was probably just the first one to be seen doing it mm-hmm. in a thing. And these are that's something that we lack so much, and I totally agree that I love that that you have have brought that up as well because it is important. It's something that mm-hmm. I talk about that all the time is the game has become too structured and it's just boring. Yes. Yes, it's yes. boring for the players who are creative too. They're like, I just want to be creative and I'm stifled mm-hmm. and we're stifling those creatives in our game. It's not even that we're not encouraging creativity. We're stifling creativity. Mm-hmm. And we talk about those studies where I don't know if you're familiar with the study, but they asked a group of kindergartners, how many uses are there for a paper clip? And they came up with like five to 10,000 uses of a paper clip. Mm-hmm. And they were, a lot of them are just crazy, inventive, imaginative things. But they came with five, 10,000. You know how many the, a, a group of high school seniors from that same area came up with? How many uses for a paperclip they came up with? About two. Five. <laughs> five uses for a paperclip. Yes. That's yes. A, such a huge, great analogy of what we've done in our game. Mm-hmm. Is we've taken that creativity out of it. Let's, let's let our kids play like five-year-olds. So anyway, a couple of last questions we have for all of our guests. The first is, and you talked about your beautiful bride and your kids and you have grandkids, I know, but how have you used the lessons you've learned directly from the game of soccer in your marriage of nearly 60 years and your parenting of four sons? Well, you, 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 you have to listen. See? Listening is 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 one of the greatest skills for any leader. Whether whether you're, you're a leader as a parent, uh, a spouse, or whatever, you you've got to listen. And the, the person doesn't have to be as smart as you are, or the person could be a younger child. Okay, if something happens, you listen to the child. Listen. Okay, and a lot, a lot of times, if we if we spend time listening, we'll get to understand why they did uh, a certain thing, and and you you let them understand that you understand why they did it, you know, and 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 but that doesn't say it's right. That's not the right thing. But the mere idea that you tell them that you understand what they did, it, it kind of opens the ears and opens all the receivers to now listen to you because you are his ally. You are his friend because you understand. And rather than just just criticizing the child for doing something wrong or the player for doing something wrong, understand why you did it and then give them the answer. And I think that has, has, has really helped me out a lot, okay? As a, as a parent, because uh, I had four boys, and you know, you know what that is. You know, it's a lot of uh, different personalities and so on, and and you know, sometimes one personality clashes with the other, and you have to sit down and show them how it's best to work things out and so on. And as a coach, that helped me out a lot in dealing with my my uh, my my life as a, as a husband and 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 as a father. Well, Coach, I feel like we've gone full circle because we started the the conversation talking about my four boys knowing everything, and we finished the conversation <laughs> with me understanding I probably just need to listen to my boys more in response a little more, yes. a little more <laughs> right? So, so mm-hmm. then I'll just offer again. Please direct message me if you need answers from my boys. They know everything. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. No, I value that, and you're right. You know, it's it's funny. I'm just laughing because I'm I'm living it. You've lived it already. I'm in mm-hmm. the middle of it. Of those personalities and how it really does overlap into, you know, the game of football and on the pitch and having to know all of your players and their different personalities and how they clash and how you bring them together to be the best team. And your family is the most important team. And that's, that's correct. And what are we doing as, as the leaders where we're the, whether we're the mother or the father or the grandparent who's having to leave the the family, what are we doing? And thank you for reminding us. We need to listen, you know, they gave it, Open our open our ears, and you're right. That leads to everything else functioning correctly. Uh, That's, so correct. That's correct. Thanks for that reminder. And as we we transition to to the the last question, we ask everybody, Coach, share with us what have you watched, read, or listened to that's most impacting 
most impacted your thinking on how soccer explains uh, life and leadership? Well, decision-making, choices, okay? A, a, a soccer player has a million and one choices to make when he gets that, when, the, when he gets, when the ball comes at, at him. First of all, he has to make a choice and a decision to go into a position to receive the ball. The ball comes to him, you know, chest high. He has to make a decision to chest the ball and chest it to the right or to the left based on the where the opponent is positioned. Okay? And then when he gets the ball down, he has to control it and look for somebody. And then he has two, three passing opportunities. Those are choices and decisions. And those are very important things that the leaders have to Leaders have to make decisions. Sometimes decisions where nobody agree with, tough decisions, but, but they have to make it. And once you get accustomed, the processes in your, in your body that are that, 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 uh, responsible for making choices and decisions, once you play soccer, those, those processes challenge often. So that when you grow up, you have, a, you know, I believe that as a, 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 a good soccer player, with all things being equal with somebody else, will have the edge to be a better leader than another person because he has had those opportunities in soccer to make choices and decisions and make them quickly, you know? And uh, and, and, and when the decisions uh, and do not go in his way, then what do you have to do? You have to adjust, you know? So soccer is a, it's, it's a lot of choices, a lot of adjustments you have to make. And that, that those are things that, that you can transfer into your life as a, as a leader. Yeah. You know, uh, there's, there's so much good stuff in this, in this episode, folks, I encourage you go back listen to those parts that, that kind of piqued your interest and take, take a lot of notes. There's so many, there's little mottos, there's great quotes. There's just great wisdom coming out from, from you coach. I just appreciate you appreciate you being on the show. Appreciate you taking the time to do this with us. And I just appreciate the life that you have lived. Yeah. I appreciate that Phil and, uh, and Paul and my next, my next profession is, is hopefully motivational speaking. I I'm getting on the speaking circuit to, to get some of these nuggets out to some of these coaches and some of these players and so on. So wish me luck as I go into yeah. my new new profession at 83 years of age. So I'm a rookie, I'm a rookie speaker. <laughs> so I love it. Keep, keep, keep reinventing yourself. I love it. <laughs> right. Keep reinventing no yourself. No doubt. 83, new age. If that's if you need any inspiration, that is it right there. Uh, just right. keep keep reinventing yourself keep le keep going where god is leading you and coach you are definitely an inspiration uh to me as a as a human uh and as a coach so thank you so much for how how you how you led and are continuing to lead your life yeah. thank, thank you so much paul and uh, phil and i uh, i like the show from the time i saw the the up at the uh, convention from the time i saw that oh my god you know I got to get on this show because it, it 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 gives you an opportunity to 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 say to people more than soccer, you know, yep. and um yep. and 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 we don't spend enough time on that. So I think it's a it's a it's a wonderful show, and I'm glad that you invited me, and I'll be very happy if you invite me back again. Yes, well, oh, we will definitely love to have you again, and we will yes. make sure. We make that happen. So we'll, we'll get that on the calendar. In the meantime, you have a movie coming out about yourself. Are you also an actor in that movie or is it a documentary or is some, is Denzel Washington playing you as yeah, a young coach? Yeah, who plays Coach Phillips? I mean, <laughs> plays coach? I mean, it's got to be Denzel, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I, I, would, I would not be acting. They, they will have actors. Right now, they're interviewing five people to be a 29-year-old Lincoln Phillips. And that's okay. where the movie is right now. The script is written. The um, directors are written. Uh, the 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 producer is Peter Lawson. If you look if you look him up, you'll see that Spotlight is one of the films 
Academy mm -hmm. Award films that he produced and and um, John Wick or whatever they call it. He was uh, responsible. So you have some top class people. The writer is Taylor Matern. He he wrote the, the movie Hustle. I don't know if you've seen that mo mm -hmm. uh, movie. And yep. so the script is written and it's ready to go. We just need to get uh, somebody to, to play my role. Once that happens, it could be tomorrow or it could be five months. It could be a year because yeah. you, you can't interview all five people at the same time. It has to be one at a time. And sometimes one person might take two months before he gets back to you. And yeah. So it's a long process. So I'm hoping that it can happen. It can happen within months. It can happen within a year. And wow. uh, so I'm I'm very excited to see what kind of movie it turns out to be. Well, very that exciting. is, if that's not a teaser for the next time we have you on, I don't know what Seriously. is. I mean, who is the, I mean, Paul, have you, have they called you to interview for that yet? They, they haven't. Come <laughs> I think it's because I'm not tall enough. Uh, I don't have any yeah, that's probably skills. what it is. That's, what that's it probably is. what it is. You're like a mirror yeah. image of coach yeah, here. Yeah. So People I, I don't know. People are going to get confused on the call. Yeah. I know. That's I know, true. That's true. Yeah. That's Whatever, true. though. So <laughs> anyway, all right, folks. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this show. Thank you for engaging it. Thank you for just taking the time. I pray, I, I do pray that you share it with others. I mean, this stuff is, is so good. And if you're, if you're learning from it, no doubt those around you will learn as well as, as coach said, you know, be motivational with them, you know, help them to learn and to be able to teach this stuff too. And so I do hope that you do that. If you want to learn more about Warrior Way, you can do that in the show notes. If you want to learn more about coaching the bigger game, you can do that in the show notes. We'll also have all the things we talked about in this episode, including Coach's book. We don't have the movie to share with you yet, but we will have him back on to talk about that movie once, once that's happening. And as always, folks, we hope that you're taking all that you're learning from this show and you're using it to help you to be a better coach, to be a better player, to be a better person in all that you do to be a better spouse, parent, and friend. And as always, we hope that you always remember that soccer does explain life and leadership. Thanks a lot. Have Absolutely. a great couple weeks.